card, and you're good to go. And wherever you want to roam is just fine. All right. So pressed into service is a good term because uh, I'm good at talking, but it's uh, jumping in when you're being asked to be filmed is going to be a little hard for me. So I'll do my best, and Larry, you can edit this part off because this isn't the start. <laughs> just uh, just pretend we're space. all sitting here naked. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That'll work. So I think one of the keys to the healthcare transformation, the cultural change, the system change that we need to undergo is finding the message in the mess. Mm -hmm. It's a message that resonates much more broadly than what we've traditionally done in our field. And uh, so what I've done is spent uh, time thinking about and working in, uh, looking at other industries, looking at healthcare, really looking for examples of where companies have done a great job figuring out how to be a piece of an operating system and, and part of a system and not have to be the whole system. And Intel comes to mind as a company that has figured out to be the Intel inside, so to speak, of multiple different operating systems. And they focused on a particular part of the value chain, in their case, the speed of processing and making that more and more efficient. And in a like way, I think primary care is really the intel of the health of a community. It's, it's a part of, when it's embedded in communities effectively, it clearly is delivering value, and I'll show you some great examples of that. However, it's not embedded in communities in powerful, consistent, reliable ways. And I like to think of primary care establishing a vision for becoming the intel of the health of all communities. When I think about um, doing this, I reflect on my whole career and actually my whole life. I was born into the family of a family physician. Uh, I was the sixth kid. I was born when my parents were in their late 40s. My dad had gone to the University of Chicago, grew up in rural South Dakota, somehow found his way to the University of Chicago Medical School. None of us really know how. He uh, went on to the University of Minnesota, trained in a year of surgery and a year of medicine, which was what you did. And he was a generalist and moved to northern Wisconsin and brought penicillin and sulfa to the residents of northwestern Wisconsin. He was the distribution mechanism for healthcare. There was, there was not 60 minutes with commercials telling people what they needed. There wasn't pharmacies that are promoting medications. Basically, if you had a doctor in your town that knew what penicillin and sulfa was and could prescribe it, you had access to it. He was the first person to bring that to that part of the world. I came into the world in the 1960s. I was born about the time family medicine was born, and my father uh, at that time had been practicing for uh, 25 years and uh, very much was what I would call the medical home of northwestern Wisconsin. Our house was the medical home of northwestern Wisconsin, and by age 10, I was a functional participant in the medical home. I was part of the answering service. I became, as I got more skilled, part of the phone triage system. Six kids knew what their roles were. We didn't have certifications, however, we were quite good at our roles. Every Tuesday night, a Mrs. Olson called at 7 o'clock from Spooner, Wisconsin. She had something my dad described as hypochondriasis. He told me the treatment was at listening, and at age 10, I was fully capable of providing treatment to Mrs. Olson on his behalf, as long as at the end of the conversation, I told her, I will tell my dad absolutely everything you have told me. I listened to Mrs. Olson for seven years, being the youngest in the family and the lowest on the pecking order. I was always delegated to the task of answering the phone at 7 o'clock on Tuesday night. I also learned to do my math and listen to Olson, Mrs. Olson at the same time. So I was being trained to work on epic and multitask without even knowing it. I went on to medical school at Wisconsin. Um, was really drawn to the holistic nature of family medicine. I'm a person who sees the forest for the trees. 
finds the message in the mess. That's been something that people who have worked with me over the years have found that I'm good at. I ended up training at a program at the University of Minnesota. The residents in that particular residency, about a fifth of them went into emergency medicine upon graduation, and about four-fifths of them, come on in. Four-fifths um, uh, went into family medicine practice. I was one of the ones that went into uh, emergency medicine, and I carried with me that notion of primary care family medicine philosophy into the emergency medicine environment, and in fact, built a group of emergency physicians seeing 72,000 patients a year, and 23 of us were family physicians uh, in Minnesota. And we, for three years in a row, were the top emergency department in Medicare data for outcomes for acute MI, for pneumonia, for congestive heart failure. We also had a track record of no lawsuits uh, in 12 years of emergency medicine practice, which is unheard of in emergency medicine. My philosophy was that the first skill that I looked for in physicians and staff when I recruited was being able to build rapport with a patient, being able to build rapport with each other. Their technical skills came second. I figured that the most important skill that family physicians and physicians in general and healthcare in general brings to the table is this commitment to understanding a problem, hearing a problem, and being able to develop trust and rapport with the patient in whatever environment we're in. I went on after doing that for 20 years and had a great opportunity to be head of design and innovation for a large health system in Minneapolis and actually was fortunate to work with a team from Stanford and learned how to look into data at what are the most glaring care gaps or opportunities for us to close care gaps. And my role was really to say what's <coughs> in the data aligns with my experience as a physician. So. It made complete sense to me when I looked at the trajectory of complex patients seeing multiple providers not really coming <coughs> home and seeing those people in the data. They were people in the emergency department who we knew and on the first name basis. And we called them frequent flyers. I knew the characteristics of these people. They often had a myriad of behavioral health medical problems, social problems, all mixed together, and really no one looking at the whole picture. The emergency department as the duct tape in the system was where they landed, and we admitted them. And then we saw them again two weeks later with the same set of problems unsolved. So it was really no surprise to me to see the data and information about the percentage of patients, spending the degree of resources, this was my life. This is what I saw. Most of my work in emergency medicine was not dealing with emergencies. It was actually dealing with system failure and the consequences of that. What I began to appreciate in this role of design and innovation is a methodology around product development, which is something I was really not acquainted with as a medical student or a practicing physician. And what I saw is there was actually a method to look at glaring gaps that had existed for a long time and think through them by stepping back and thinking about who's affected by those gaps, actually <coughs> study the patient experience by following real people through real experiences and documenting what occurred from an objective point of view. What that did was inform me about the multiple levels of stakeholders that are involved in creating the value chain in healthcare and the limited perspective I had had as a physician. And if we were going to design our way out of and in our, innovate our way out of our current problems, we needed to rethink the way that we were messaging what it is we were trying to accomplish. We needed to rethink the way we were organizing and the systems in which we operated in. We needed to rethink our role as physicians and primary care physicians. What I eventually, over time, came up with is 
the what I would call the design criteria, the primary care design criteria. And in design work, you really want to step <coughs> back and not be um, uh, person or, or uh, site specific. You want to really step back and try to figure out what are the fundamental processes, what are the fundamental things that drive value in this part of the system. And you come down really to three basic elements that drive long-term value when we think about primary care. One is right actions or relevance. What's really helped me here is to transition from thinking of relevance in the context of treating a disease to relevance in the context of creating well-being. It broadens the scope of our work in a way that's incredibly productive and begins to bring in things like mindfulness. Uh, exercise, all these things that we know on one level are good, however, when we change our endpoint to trying to achieve well-being in a population, it shifts our focus to a much broader set of capabilities that we can bring to the table. The other key feature of great primary care is it's accessible. It's in the right place at the right time, and I've seen this repeatedly. Most patients in the emergency department had called their clinic before they tried, they ended up in the emergency department. And our systems today open with, if you have an emergency or you think it might be an emergency, hang up and call 911. So we've trained our population to go to the emergency department when they have a problem that they're not sure what to do with. <coughs> This accessibility is a game changer. I like to call it answer the damn phone as the simple nature of it. And in the 1960s, when the phone rang at our house, it was answered. And it was someone's job to answer the phone. The phone did not go unanswered. And we have left our phones unanswered in healthcare at the key times, and that is why one of the reasons major drivers of utilization is inaccessibility. The other thing that is just <coughs> critical in designing systems is they need to be sustainable for the user. The users of the system are patients and providers, and the users have been highly disenfranchised by people designing the systems. The systems have been designed intentionally for the users. They've been designed for the mathematicians and actuaries and financial people that are driving major parts of system design. So the breakthrough design is really look at these three features and then figure out how to embed them in the community. Some of the data that tells us we have variability in the U.S. is very compelling. This is the spending in the last two years of life uh, in the United States. And you can see in Los Angeles, Miami, and New York, we spend over $110,000 per Medicare beneficiary in the last two years of life. In Rochester, New York, and La Crosse, Wisconsin, we spend less than $50,000 per beneficiary in the last two years of life. This data comes out of a mountain of Medicare data for the last several years. I asked an analyst that I work with to actually find the most highly correlated uh, variables in this data set. And the number one correlation was the number of specialists seen in the last two years of life. And on an individual level, that's understandable. On a population level, that's not understandable. That is a, that's a feature of a system failure of primary care in these marketplaces. The other thing that's fascinating is La Crosse, Wisconsin has had a community-based program calling it, called Respecting Choices that has engaged the community in, in making care plans. That program, I believe, also has, is a reason why La Crosse, Wisconsin is the least expensive community to get health care in the last two years of life. The other thing that we looked at in this data is we wanted to see were there, was there evidence of improved outcomes in these cities that had higher costs and there are not, there is not evidence of better outcomes. The other thing we found in these cities is they had a high incidence of ICU death. More people die in intensive care units uh, than, any, than in any other locations. So, 
What's frustrating to me as a Minnesota Norwegian is when I talk about this on the East Coast, what they say is the reason that is is your nurses are paid less and you die in your sleep in the Midwest. Um, I don't think that's why it is. <laughs> I think it's because of evolved primary care systems in the Midwest. Uh, I would say more community cohesiveness uh, that helps support people at a difficult time in their life. And it's fascinating to study this variability. You may remember when I gave this talk in in Ohio, I asked what's in Elyria, Ohio, that's a county in Ohio, and someone called out the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you can see that it's significantly higher than Dayton, Ohio, uh, with a similar population mix. It's, it's just fascinating that we don't think of the Cleveland Clinic driving cost. However, when you really look at the data, those types of large integrated delivery systems with great ac access to specialty care do drive up healthcare costs. So I want to talk a little bit about what a relevant action is. This is really key and we sometimes look at in healthcare the technical side of medical evidence as being the important feature. And what's really advanced my thinking, and I would say our team's thinking about this work, is that it's actually social and technical. So there's evidence, for instance, that if patients don't trust their providers, they actually don't take their medicine. So you can do everything right technically, but get a completely different result if you're not paying attention to the social aspects of human interaction. And when we talk about system design, we need to be thinking about the social and the technical aspects of the interactions and how those are built into the design in a way that's sustainable. That, I would say, is the number one failure of our system today in fee-for-service. The social aspects of the interaction have been overwhelmed by the technical aspects, and this has actually been accelerated by electronic health records and the emphasis on billing and coding. So part of what we do when we look at design and system design is to step back like that and think harder about changing the way we define things and changing what we decide is important, but not do it just because we think it's that way, but be driven by real evidence that tells us with better social connection we get better results the design criteria for a relevant action. The other thing that's really been a breakthrough for me is establishing market relevance. And what that means is that what's relevant in Minneapolis may not be relevant in Rochester, Minnesota, may not be relevant in Omaha, Nebraska. What's evidence for an employer like 3M may not be relevant for an employer like Target. For example, Target as a corporation spends one third of all of its health spending on birth and the first year of life because they have a very young workforce. 3M spends over 50% of its health spending on musculoskeletal conditions because it's full of aging engineers and their families. So you have to really look at if you're designing a system what, is, what are the characteristics of the population you're going to serve so that you can start to design around the conditions that are most relevant from a quality <coughs> and cost perspective. That brings us to this notion of community operating system. So Intel decided to be, to be exceptional at data processing and, and, and speed of information, of being able to speed the process of organizing complex information. So they managed to do that, but manifested in multiple different operating systems, Dell computers, um, all sorts of different brands of computers you find in the Intel inside. It's because they figured out how to get really good at something, define what it is, and then figure out how to adapt what they were really good at to the different operating systems. Primary care is much the same in my mind. If we start to define community operating systems, ways to make care accessible, relevant, and sustainable, you begin to get a different look at the continuum of care. We need to 
to maintain those, uh, the accessibility, sustainability, you need to really figure out what's satisfying to a provider and to your customer or the patient. Will someone buy it? You have to find out, will someone provide it? Will they enjoy the work that we've designed for them to do? Will they be passionate about it? And then, will someone pay for it at a level that you can cover the cost? This is very basic to business people. This was not the way I thought about healthcare as I was out practicing in the mess. So basically, what I work on with clients uh, from health systems to health plans to manufacturers to venture capital funds is how do we begin to look at care gaps and turn them into market opportunities that lead to sustainability. Care, back, care gap is a need for relevant action. A market opportunity is a sustainable one clinical business model that satisfies the stakeholders who are paying for value. So the trends that I'm seeing right now that are redefining how primary care is going to look in the next couple decades include clinic practice redesign, which is a different way of thinking about our clinics, moving to a more team-based model. There's been much <coughs> learned in the last 10 years about clinic practice redesign and doing it in a, in a way that's sustainable. The other thing that's happening is what I would call new distribution models. So there are different ways of distributing care to the community. We've been stuck in the clinic, hospital, healthcare system for a very long time. Retail health has proven that there's a different way to provide a certain set of services. And I'll show you a myriad of other models that have emerged that provide primary care, but they do it in a different distribution system. And then new payment models are designed around the distribution system that you've designed because you get new efficiencies <coughs> and you create new value for a different set of customers and different people begin to contribute to the business that you've created. So these are the various models that have emerged, the distribution models, and have emerged in front of us and around us and are beginning to reach a level of uh, performance that we can really begin to think about scale. How do we actually scale primary care using these different distribution models? So I'm going to cover the clinic model first. At Fairview, we redesigned, we started with one clinic in Egan, Minnesota, and we went in and held the salaries constant for 10 physicians in that clinic and to start the process of redesign, we asked them what was their biggest pain point. We decided that the physician and the staff at the clinic were the primary customer of the redesign. The patient was the secondary customer. And the reason we decided that is we had looked at our burnout data amongst our physicians and our engagement data, and it's at threatening levels very threatening levels to sustainability of the system. If we don't have primary care staff and providers, we won't have primary care. <laughs> and so you really have to intentionally think about who is the primary customer, and it is the staff. And in healthcare, we have way underappreciated the importance of engaging our staff passionately in the work they do. We focus on the patient and the waiting room. We don't focus on the people who are providing the work. There's mountains of evidence that tell us that the engagement, the passion of the people doing the work translates directly into the quality of the product. Directly into the quality of the product. So what we've come up with after lots of learning at Fairview, the docs in that first clinic said when we asked them what their biggest pain point was, they said 90 minutes of take-home work on Epic every night after clinic. That was enough to work on. And what was interesting to me is in a very typical physician way, they said, when I said, let's work on that, they said, Dave, what are you going to do about it? And 
I said, I don't even know what's in your electronic health record. I, I know you have lots of stuff, but I don't practice primary care. I don't actually use Epic at that stage. I have no idea what's in there. I think it's your work to figure out how to get rid of it. They paused and were used to having work tossed back in that way. And I said, all I need to know is what you need to be successful. That's my job, is to help you be successful at getting rid of the work. They, we tipped off, uh, at that point, a design process where we really looked at what was in the inbox, what was the work left at the end of the day, and we discovered most of what was left at the end of the day was due to the lack of communication that's occurring during the day. And the rules that have been set up around scheduling, who gets to do what, who can approve what, and uh, and also just the the electronic health record has segmented physicians into small little pockets and it's, and staff. They're no longer talking to each other. They're sending each other messages. <laughs> and what we found is that it's an extremely efficient, inefficient way to communicate. The other thing we discovered is at the front desk, the receptionists are trained to tell people what they can't have. So they ask for an appointment and they immediately tell them they can't do that, so they try to get them to do something they didn't want. That's a very hard role. Uh, and the reason they do that is because they have been the front line of a deluge of requests and have been screamed at for giving patients what they wanted, like an appointment this afternoon, if it didn't fit with what the staff in the back thought it should have. You make one mistake like that when you're a receptionist and there's doctors and nurses up here behind the wall, you don't make that mistake again. You start learning to keep people away from what they need. Fascinating to me, in the first clinic, when we changed that, the physicians had to say, the receptionist's job is to give people what they want and our job is to be there for you when you say what it is what they need, we need to figure out how to get it to them, real time. We forced the receptionist into a team with the staff, and we began operating more like my house in Shell Lake, Wisconsin in the 1960s. There was shared knowledge of what we were trying to accomplish. When the phone rang, we all knew there was an escalation protocol. If it was the nurse from OB, we knew we were supposed to get her, go get their, our dad. If it was Mrs. Olson, we listened. There was a way that we built in the intelligence of what we were trying to accomplish into the way these teams operated. Amazingly, the first phase of design in Egan within 30 days, all take home work was eliminated by the team. Just addressing communication. So what's happened in this world of clinic redesign is that we've gotten much smarter. And I've learned some things, like there's not one type of provider. Everybody doesn't need a scribe. The same staffing patterns don't work for the same people, <coughs> for different people. However, there are not a hundred kinds of physicians. There's actually four. And you can decide what kinds of physicians you're working with based on productivity data, quality data, patient experience data, chart completion data. And you can begin designing a solution that works for the clinician. After the talk I gave a couple weeks ago, a physician from Palm Springs came up and said in his system, there are two physicians that are highly productive, high quality physicians, they have a very hard time completing their charts on EPIC. The MBA trained leader of the clinic, when Joe suggested that these physicians might be benefited <coughs> by a scribe, said, what I don't want to do is reward bad behavior. It's fascinating to think about that as bad behavior. What we're dealing with is a human characteristic. We aren't going to shame our way out of people not being comfortable with some of the small work of documentation. What we want to do is characterize them 
as high performers who are great at relationships, great at throughput, and then give them a scribe and then watch their productivity go up and their satisfaction. Many people have asked me, how do you figure out how to segment the practice? It's really complicated. We go in and ask the physicians what they need. They will tell you why they struggle if you ask them. And you will, if you honor that, you will learn that there are about four different ways that physicians need help. Some need more nurses if they have a complex geriatric population. So it's provider characteristics and population characteristics. Characteristics, it's the combination of those things that determines the type of clinic redesign you should do. Christine Sinsky has done some wonderful work in this area. Here's some data that comes out of a practice um, with Kevin Hopkins and what they've shown with an approach that really focuses on uh, building support into the clinic is that you can actually drive meaningful numbers that are meaningful in the CFO office. So where I'm doing this in Indianapolis, we've used a methodology to define their clinical practice of 250 primary care providers and we've used this data to convince the CFO to invest in the infrastructure that we want to build into the primary care practice to drive practice performance. I don't have the satisfaction data here, but the provider satisfaction data also went up dramatically in this process. So clinic redesign has a now a level of sophistication that I think it's a repeatable process that can be driven across practices However, the leadership model of we have it figured out at the top and we're going to tell you what to do doesn't work very well. The best approach is to go in and ask the clinicians what is their biggest problem and then engage them in solving it with the tools that are evidence-based and guide them through a process of finding the answer. The next setting I want to talk about is a massive cost opportunity. Two-thirds of all variable Medicare cost occurs in the post-acute space. Um, this is the part of the population that's spending 80% of all Medicare care resources. The average American today after age 65 will spend as much out of pocket on health care as Medicare spends on them. Each couple will spend, Medicare will spend $320,000 over the course of a lifetime on health care. If they have resources, health care will also consume $320,000 of their personal savings. That number is not going to go down. That number is going up. Medicare isn't moving up much more. There's more and more efforts to thrust the burden of an overbuilt health care system onto people who can afford health care after age 65. So there's a great reason for people not to ignore the consumption that's occurring in healthcare. And what's fascinating to me about this part of the population is the boomers are at a stage of having watched their parents go through a system that doesn't work and be harmed. I never go into a room with executives and leaders of industries anymore and tell my story. I go in and ask anyone if they've had an experience with healthcare that hasn't been optimal, and there's literally a line to tell the stories about what happened to my mom and dad. And these are CEOs of companies. The other thing fascinating about the boomers is they actually care about their children and the world we're leaving them. So there's this amazing alignment of energy around this change. On the, I don't want to get what my parents got. I don't want to leave nothing for my children, both in terms of my personal assets, but also in terms of our country's assets. There's really connecting of the dots going on. This population is powerful to think about. There's some great data 
that tells us that the 16% of the Medicare population that we can now reliably identify with a predictive model of spending over 80% of the resources. And these are people who lack access to the system as it's designed today. These are people who find it difficult to get to the clinic. These are people that are stuck in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. These are people that are homebound and socially isolated. This population does not have access to our clinic and hospital until they call 911 and get brought to the emergency department. 80% of these people get admitted to the hospital if they arrive at the emergency department. The, the data in this um, group is fascinating. Ken Colburn is a physician from Philadelphia that's done a doubly blinded, randomized control trial with over 3,000 people that, that meet these criteria in Philadelphia. And what he's learned over the course of 13 years with a set of social and nursing and, and primary care interventions is that he's reduced hospitalizations, emergency visits, and has had a net savings of $400 per month in the most expensive population that Medicare has. The other thing fascinating about this is that this is not an end-of-life problem. This is a chronic disease problem. So people who meet these criteria actually live for a long time. We may have seen Diane's data yesterday that 40% of the spending problem in the, in the what I would call more chronic disease part of this equation is not end of life, it's chronic disease. And this study uh, is showing us the way forward with the most expensive population. The other thing that's fascinating is the, this population lives longer and exper experiences fewer deaths with better access to social services, nursing services in the community, and primary care services. So if you look here at Ken's data, it's pretty fascinating to see that the physician office visit is 1% of the interactions that produce these results. 40% were home visits, 38% were phone calls, 7% were group visits. There's lots of room for creativity in terms of how we distribute the types of services that provide value to this very high cost population. So these are what I would call the operational requirements of community-based care uh, in this model. Team-based relationship center care is fundamental and the team includes primary care docs, pharmacists, social workers, nurses, uh, community members are all part of the team. We also find this population with a different predictive model. We don't wait till they've had three admissions and um, 14 ER visits and then try to stop the train. You, can, you need to find this pop population further upstream and there's some new social and medical predictive models that are more accurate at finding these people earlier. The other key is in the distribution model. It's important to have a hub and spoke distribution. Hub and spoke distribution is an engineering concept. It means you have some key services in a hub and you have key services in a spoke. If you think of a trauma center being a hub and with multiple spokes and different levels of trauma centers and an ambulance system that feeds the trauma center, that's been an effective way to lower our death rate with patients who experience trauma. It's a hub and spoke design. In a very similar way, community-based care benefits from the same efficiencies of a hub and spoke design. And if you lay out on a map where people who are underserved and overserviced live, they actually live where we are not building our primary care clinics. And I'll tell you why. When I was head of Fairview's clinics and, and that part worked in that part of our system, we had a methodology to decide where to build the clinic, and it was that the commercial payer mix was 70% or greater. And these people are generally not on commercial insurance. That's why you have four clinics across the street from each other in Indiana, Minnesota, competing for patients, and no clinics where these people live. So we have designed our system to block access 
for this population, which is transportation challenged, socially challenged. And so the entire system has been designed backward. The hub and spoke design, you lay down the map and you look at where these people are aggregating. And where they're aggregating is in community centers, schools, and uh, senior housing, senior campuses. And depending on which population you're trying to serve and which business model, you use that map and you define the community operating system based on where people live and where they spend time. And it starts to give you insights into how you can design a hub and spoke model to distribute the service. The other key feature in this population is care planning that engages the social network determining who are the key decision makers, making sure they're aligned with the care plan, great evidence that shows in communities that have a higher incidence of care planning, that leads to a lower incidence of unnecessary utilization. Most populations, less than 30% of patients who should have care plans have care plans. In La Crosse, Wisconsin, 99% of people have care plans and 99% of them are honored when they come to the hospital. The other fascinating thing about care planning is there's much lower incidence of residual grief and depression in the family when they've been through an effective care planning process prior to death. Many of the baby boomers that talk about the experience of their parents are in tears. It's called complex grief. They feel responsible for overutilization that occurred, for the harm that occurred to their parent, and they feel residual effects of that. It's been documented that leads to depression. So care planning is an essential feature of the model. Relevant responsiveness, answer the damn phone. Social technologies, there's great opportunities to use texting, other kinds of social technologies to engage the network in caring for the patient. The other model, <coughs> as an example of a different business model, is direct <coughs> primary care. You, Erica Bliss in the Seattle market now has 30 providers providing care to 35,000 patients and they pay for care using a subscription model. They no longer code and bill insurance companies. They're paid a subscription model. It's changed the way they document. It's changed many of their visits to being over the phone and via email the way people are now used to communicating. It's a wonderful model for a certain population. The potential limitation of this model is the panel sizes are 800 to 1,000 patients. We have a primary care shortage in this country, likely. And I actually believe that to be true, given the aging population. A model for 800 to 1,000 <coughs> patients is probably not scalable as a solution to the entire population. However, I will say that it is very relevant and scalable for certain populations. And Erica is discovering who those populations are. And they're often employed, have commercial insurance, often have one chronic condition in their family uh, that needs uh, re management with a relationship. And they're willing to pay for access, reliable access, which they've discovered they need when they have a chronic condition. So it's a great model for a segment of the population, and it belongs on the continuum. I don't see it as a standalone. Retail uh, is a model I worked in Minneapolis developing tar target clinics with Target Corporation. Uh, I, what we could see is that's an aggregator for certain kinds of services. People go to these places a lot in their week, and if you can put some uh, straightforward, simple healthcare services in those settings and figure out a business model that works between the sponsoring health system, the retailer, you can end up providing a better service for the patient. In the target model, with us providing the medical direction quality oversight, being on backup to talk to nurse practitioners working in the clinic as physicians, uh, we ended up generating a 30% profit margin as the medical director partner target ended up generating $100 of sales per person who used their clinic. That's what they were looking for. And we ended up being able to create a model for retail health that benefited the retailer, benefited the patient, and benefited the health system that was working uh, in partnership. And that's a great example in my mind of different stakeholders, different distribution model, different value stream and exchange of value to make it worth doing together, which is what it takes. 
schools. There's some great examples of school-based care in some communities in North New Orleans in particular uh, is a great example of people discovering that children will not have access to care if it's contained in the clinics of the health system. They don't, the way to get care to children in New Orleans is to provide it in schools. And there's a win for schools. More children come to school. Their presenteeism is evident. That translates to funding. There's a win for a health system who is beginning to establish its brand with families. There's a win for patients and families who get access to great services <coughs> in the school. So the idea is to figure out what services are needed. It may not be physician service. It may be nursing services. It may be social services. And then figure out the environment and provide those services. And then finally, the employer. There's some great employer-based models where employers are now hiring health systems to provide primary care physicians to their employees. There's a great example in Indianapolis where seven school systems have gotten together and built a primary care clinic and now 41% of all employees of the school system and their dependents have identified that as their primary care clinic and the school system is seeing reduced utilization on the back end because we've established a primary care hub that's relevant and distributed where these people live. Online is an amazing environment for care, uh, for the right kinds of care. In Minneapolis, we have a company called Virtuel, where you type in symptoms for simple conditions. There's a limited scope of practice, and within 30 minutes or less, uh, you can get access to a prescription or advice. 30% uh, I believe of these visits, I haven't seen their latest data, but in their early data a prescription was dispensed, 70% it was advice and reassurance. Um, these, this has now generated over 100,000 visits uh, in Minneapolis. These are not going to stop. Uh, this kind of care particularly appeals to the younger part of the population. Somebody asked me um, what a panel size should be for a practitioner serving uh, young people, and I said 30,000 maybe patients per provider. Uh, with tools like this, you can touch literally thousands of lives and make a difference and influence behavior and direct and guide but you don't have to ever see them face to face, and I'm here to report that the millennials aren't real hung up on coming to see us <laughs> at all at this stage of their life. They want something fast that works, period. So um, this is a fascinating example of another business model, distribution model, and our role is maintaining a commitment to evidence-based practice. In other words, if we find that we're over-prescribing antibiotics for colds in this type of a setting, it's our responsibility to drive it back to appropriate use. Our role isn't to be the primary actor in some of these models. So this drawing, you know, well, I think we're here. The early business model innovation has been happening over the course of years. Uh, the early adopters have emerged in all of these different settings, business models, distribution models, staffing patterns, financial models have been established. It's really our work to now think about how do we distribute primary care using a different approach. How do we adapt? How do we become the intel that adapts to the various community operating systems that our communities operate in today? I believe very much in this quote, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. I think we have a major role in finding the message in the mess, figuring out how we communicate it and to who, and proceeding with distributing and scaling what is really hopeful and promising work in primary care. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Does it make sense to you? It does, yeah. Yeah, the uh, other side.